Okay, I'll just ask that we have a quick word of prayer and we'll get started. Father in heaven, we ask for the blessing of your spirit as we open your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, again, this is a study. It's not a lecture by me. So I invite your participation as we, as we go. And um, my, my hope is to, my, sorry, um, technical issues here. My hope is to recap um, a study that was shared by um, Aldo Parminda earlier this year at the Islands of the Sea Camp meeting. I want to hone in on a particular concept and, and talk about it and hopefully develop it a little further, um, add, add to it a little. It's, um, it's the study that he presented elaborating on the nature of man, right? Um, and as he elaborated on the nature of man, he, he made note of this concept which I will write down, this concept of reflex, right? Um, reflex versus reason. And um, that's what we'll be talking about today. And in terms of the context for recapping this material, as we go forward into, into this dispensation, we, we, know, we know that uh, in terms of where we currently stand within our dispensation, this dispensation goes from 2019 to 2021. And if we look at it from the perspective of um, the model given to us by the midnight cry, we know that we have a Boston, a Concord, and Exeter, followed by test. Right, and where do we currently stand? Does someone, can someone say? In this pattern that is being fulfilled, where do we currently stand? Um, I would say Exeter only because I know the Concord has happened. Okay, so you're saying we're at Exeter? Or in between Concord and Exeter, I don't know. I'm just guessing because it, the Concord has happened. When did Concord happen? May. Happened in May, May the twenty fifth, or was it the fifth of May? Something like that. But in May. Okay. Does anyone else have anything else to add to that in terms of where we currently stand? Formalization of the message. Formalization. So would that be? at Concord or Exeter or in between? Uh, what is it, not sure? I'm not sure, I don't sure is it? I'm just looking at it, I'm not sure. I think okay. this is like um, the last camp meeting, the formalization of the message. Okay, yeah, because you write it, it what it was spoken about at the last camp um, that we're currently here. We've passed Concord and we are heading towards um, heading towards Exeter, right? And what do we see taking place at Exeter, right? Because at Boston, a message is unsealed, correct? 
at Concord, what do we see? Increase of knowledge. Increase of knowledge. Then at Exeter, the formalization, right? Uh, leading up to the test. What do we see at the formalization? What was the characteristic that was identified? What are we knowing is going to take place at the form formalization or rather, I guess that's a too broad a question, but basically a message is unsealed, right? In the increase of knowledge, that message looks, um, you're receiving an increase of knowledge, but it looks harmless, right? There's no, it's not really threatening, if that may, if it may be put that way. But when the message is formalized, uh, we finally understand the point to which the increase of knowledge was building towards, right? And when that message is formalized and the point is understood, um, that's when it becomes hard. What we see then is a, is a shaking, right? A shaking culminating at the test way mark. So um, in this dispensation, we've been receiving an increase of knowledge on the message of the last dispensation. And the message on the message that opened up in the last dispensation. And the message opened up in the last dispensation was the midnight cry, which dealt with the subject of equality. Right? And in this dispensation, right, so this increase of knowledge we're receiving right now, this message, which looks, um, you know, it's essentially refining and clarifying that, that, that which opened up under the midnight cry. Uh, when we come to Exeter and the point to which we've been building is understood, um, it's, this is when it becomes hard, right? Because um, it requires the formalized message always calls for a change of character, a change of behavior. And that's not, that's not easy, right? And it's this change of character, this change of behavior being called forth by the formalized message that leads to a shaking, which culminates in, um, which culminates in two classes. Right, so um, we ought to be looking ahead. And I guess that's the sad reality that we're not done with shakings. Shakings are still coming, right? As we look to the future ahead, we have to, we have to now be positioning ourselves to rightly understand the formalized message and stand on the side of truth um, at Exeter. And not only to stand on the side of truth, but to help those who are going to struggle, right? Um, to help them, to give them the best shot at, at understanding and taking the correct position uh, in this test that is approaching. Right. So in terms of the context for this study, um, it's with an eye towards the future that I'm going back and recapping some of these concepts because we know what shakings look like. Um, they, you know, they can start over points of doctrine, but you know, they then develop and morph into something else. Then it becomes uh, you know, breakdown and separation at a personal level, right? And we all know how unpleasant that is. So um, again, it's looking forward to the future, understanding what's approaching that uh, we should now be preparing ourselves, um, positioning ourselves to receive God's blessing and to correctly understand uh, the formalized message when it arrives. Right? So the uh, subject that I want us to recap is again, um, 
was Parmin, was covered by Elder Parminda at the Islands of the Sea Camp meeting, Reflex versus, versus Reason. So I'll just go straight into it because I'm assuming that most, if not all of us have gone through that material. And um, if you haven't, then this, you know, uh, I, I think maybe I, I, I do enough of an overview to, to give a basic understanding, but I'd encourage us to go back if you haven't seen these studies already. So uh, even though we, we claim to believe line upon line, right? A lot of the time in practice, um, we, 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 we don't actually practice it, right? Uh, people take subjects, they study them in a limited fashion, and then they think they understand what they're reading about. This is a very common thing. And it's been uh, a point of emphasis over the last little while to, I guess, to understand this dynamic and the various ways in which it has gotten us into trouble. Right? Um, how, how, can this, how, how can this concept be summarized? We tend to look at the part and then uh, think it equals the, the whole, right? And this simplistic reasoning is not correct, right? You see, it's, the, it's, been, it's been the cause of a lot of uh, errors that have um, troubled the movement, right? That errors that we are now, that we are now correcting. Right, which I think the part equals the whole. Um, and what are examples of where we see this? Uh, we see that we've seen this commonly in, in the perspectives people have about certain subjects that they read about the subject in the spirit of prophecy and they take a part of the subject and, and make broad deductions um, based on only having read a part of the testimony of that subject, psychology is one example. You can find statements where she says, um, where she says, what about psychology? That it's satanic? Yeah, you can find statements where she says it's of Satan, essentially, and you can find statements which say what else? Right, that there's a heavenly science of psychology. So people would tend to uh, read, um, read one or a few statements on a given subject and uh, make general generalizations about that entire subject based on the testimony of that which they read. Right, and depending on your disposition, depending on your mindset and your um, your enculturation, depending on uh, you know, uh, I guess your upbringing, all the various factors that that play into who you are and how you think, um, you may lean towards towards this idea that you know psychology is of Satan, or you know, you may lean towards this idea. But uh, for a rounded perspective of the subject, what must we do? For a rounded perspective of the subject, we need to? Look at it as a whole. On all level. Yes, read all the testimony mm -hmm. on a given subject. Then we can we can balance out, read all the testimony and read it in context. And when we do that, we can balance out these uh, semi, uh, apparently contradictory perspectives, right? So that was covered, this tendency that we have to uh, read in part and, 
and uh, make general deductions from the little information that we read. There is a term for this that I'll introduce, right? This is called a, it is called a cognitive shortcut. As human beings, we take cognitive shortcuts all the time. It makes life easier, right? It streamlines our lives, but it can also get us into trouble. Right? So uh, Parmento is making the point that uh, this problem, this issue that we have of taking cognitive shortcuts and how it leads to incorrect conclusions about what God's word teaches, um, it's not an issue of habit. It's not an issue that you can just um, train, train out, train, train yourself out of, right? Uh, you know, in, in a simple way. And he makes the point that within the body, there are two systems, right? Within the body, there are uh, two systems, and people think they can harness or control these two systems, but they cannot. What are these two systems? Hold on with me. What are these two systems? Are you talking about biological system? Well, I said within the body. Um, oh, because I'm thinking about well, the uh, I, and uh, what's the other one? Peripheral. But I'm not you sure. Said the what? That's what you're talking about. What'd you say? I'm thinking about the, the circulatory and the peripheral, but I don't think that's what you're talking about. No, not talking about uh, yeah. biology in that sense, not two systems in the sort of anatomical sense. Um, I, I don't know if it's, if we can say uh, two, two systems within the mind. Two systems within the mind. Like physical and spiritual. Beg your pardon? Beg your pardon? Is that physical and spiritual? No, not physical and spiritual. I'll say it, it's reflex mm -hmm. and reason. These are the two systems that operate within us at a psychological level, right? Does someone care to describe these two systems and their characteristics? So the reflex is like your flight where because something happened, you react to it quickly without thinking about it. Okay, what? you said it's While like what? Like your flight system, um, flight mode, mode, reacting to something quickly. Okay, when you react to something quickly without thinking about it, really, what what's another term for that? Like animals do it, and we say they operate on flight or uh, react instinct. Uh, instinct. Sorry, instinct. Right. So reflex is instinctual. And what would be the opposite of that? Or rather, what's, what's, how is reason, um, what is the characteristic of reason? Where reflex is instinctual, reason is? Logical, I'm thinking. Logical. Um, reflex can be logical. <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I can't think of another word. Okay. I'll put here instinct. He gave characteristics of, of the. Beg your pardon? 
intentional. More intentional. Okay, I guess you're framing it in different words. You know, let me lay it out in in the term in the words that were stated. Um, right. We we. It was identified that uh, reflex or instinct is fast, and reason is slow. Right. Reflex is always on. You don't need to think about it uh, for it to operate. It operates constantly within your, within your being without you having to think about it. And reason, uh, the expression was used that it's generally in sleep mode. It's generally in sleep mode and needs to be woken up. Um, reflex occurs automatically. And reason takes effort. And if we think about these two systems from the, how they operate at the level of how we read God's word, with reflex, the instinctual response, right? The fast sort of natural response is to, is to read a part. And then from that part, make uh, broad generalizations about the world and how it operates. So I, to basically say that the part equals the whole. Whereas with reason, when one reasons, they understand that the part does not equal the whole. Because we must, we must consider the context and the perspective or position from which we are viewing a certain issue. So, so however you wanna frame it, the fast brain or the slow brain, uh, reflex versus reason, right? Instinct versus um, versus, uh, you know, careful thinking, right? These are the two um, systems that function within us and they've been put there for a reason, right? It, it's, it's part of our human nature that we have uh, these two systems within us and we cannot educate ourselves out of them, right? It, it is, they are part of our human nature. So understanding these two systems becomes important uh, when seeking to understand our, our behavior, right? Uh, when seeking to understand our behavior, because when you look at conflict, when conflict emerges um, between us, the, the, the two central things at issue, a lot of the, at the, the two things that we see at the center of these conflicts, it, it, it's one, uh, behavior and what we believe and how we behave, right? And um, differences in what we believe, which then impact uh, our understanding of, of how we are how we are to behave. So understanding these two systems is important when seeking to understand our own behavior. It is also important because um, it impacts how we, these two systems come into play when we think about how we are to understand God's word, right? Naturally, naturally, um, 
people, when studying God's word, people uh, dwell in the realm of reflex rather than, rather than reason. Right. Um, and this has problems, problems that we've already stated and problems that we will unpack. Because right? I want us to, to unpack the issues, um, the issues with in reflexive thinking, both at the level of our conduct with one another and how we view one another, right? And also at the level of God's word. Uh, so what do I have in my notes? These systems have been put in place to protect us. Um, you may think, what's the point of having this reflex system when it gets us into trouble so much? But it has its place, right, in, in, the, in the human system. When you are at the back of an alley about to get robbed, that's when you see where uh, these, this reflexive system, this fight or flight uh, you know, um, or maybe not fight or flight yet, but it will it will trigger a fight or flight response in that situation, and that happens as a function of instinct, reflex, right? So it has its um, it has its place. But to be a good student of prophecy, to be a good student of prophecy, and when studying God's word, we have to have a different approach. Um, we have to exercise reason. And um, as, we, as we identified, reason takes effort. It takes effort to, uh, it takes effort and time, right? It's slow. It takes effort and time to reason out a subject. Right, and you can train yourself uh, to make reason uh, the, the second system, uh, less lazy. This was another characteristic that I hadn't, I hadn't put down. Um, yeah, when we say generally in sleep mode, we could call it lazy. We can train ourselves to make reasoning, the reason, so the system of reason less lazy, both when it comes to God's word and when it comes to how we view one another and how we interact with one another. I have a note here that says, if people say, give me the answer, give me the summary, what's the main point, right? They're, they're living in a, in a system one world. They're living in a, within the realm of, of reflex and not of reason, right? Uh, because reason understands that when it comes to God's word, there's a whole lot more to consider in terms of correct, in terms of coming to a correct understanding of a subject than simply what is the punchline. Just give me the summary. What is the punchline, right? Um, there's so many other parts of our lives where that type of thinking is encouraged and it may even be helpful, right? But in this sphere, we need to realize that it's a detriment and a danger and we need to uh, take the effort to, um, to, 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 to reason, right? To, 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 take, to make the effort to awaken that system of reason and take the time to consider subjects more carefully. Right, it can be boring, it can be tedious, but that is the discipline that we need to put ourselves through. Is someone saying something? I don't uh, hear. You're not hearing me? I, yeah, you, but you're very low though. Oh, you're there, okay, that's a little better. That's a little better, yeah. I wanted more clarity as it relates to the point you were making um, about our interaction with people. Um, you were making the point about reason. About reason? What do you want clarity on? What do you want clarity on? 
you were saying um, you were saying like two points. Sorry, uh, yeah. sorry, some more. You're really, sorry, some more. You're really low. Uh, and there's feedback. I don't know. Oh, the letter you are making two points. The letter point is what I'm getting at. Off reason. I don't remember the first reason. Or, or maybe type your question. Maybe type your question, um, and I'll and I'll come to it when you've done so. Because it's, your volume is just really low, I, and it was chopping up. I couldn't really hear. Okay, so while we wait for that, I'll, I'll just continue. It says, uh, so these systems take on. Um, special significance when it comes to our behavior towards each other and our relationships, right? How we view each other, our relationships, and how we behave toward uh, one another. Because in this movement, you know, that's what it is on a level. It's a network of relationships. And God is seeking to bring us into unity, um, you know, and, and in terms of the unity that God is seeking to lead us into, it is, uh, it is not simply at the doctrinal level, but it extends to our relationships, how we view and treat one another. Right? Um, yes? That was a point. That was a point that I was, I needed clarity on. But you did, you did expound on it. Thank you. Okay, no problem. So when it comes to relationships, uh, we need to, um, you know, when it comes to our relationships, let's take courting, for example, why do we need to court? Why is courtship needed if you want to if you're looking to get to get married, right, to find a companion, um, why is the courtship process needed? Think in terms of uh, our reflexive mind and our reasoning mind. What would reflex tend to do versus what would reason tend to do? I guess um, reflex would go up, would go ahead and, and marry quickly. Um, the courting system is reason um, is going beyond that. It is taking the time to really establish if this person is really who you want to to marry. So, mm -hmm. so it takes the effort or consider the whole thing and not just a part, whole a part of you or your being, just how you feel. But it and I'm gonna I'm gonna again use the word logic mm -hmm. in. Uh, in another sense from being in just a reflex but having a reason behind of it um true all correct yeah and and i guess i was just about to say the same thing if not slightly differently which is that uh in relationships uh we need that courtship period because uh what does reflex tend to tell us reflex uh reflexive thinking is first impressions you know uh First imp the first impressions we have of people tend to stick. And we make those deductions based on limited information. But does a first impression give a, a true or full picture about, uh, a, you know, a, a person, you know, not necessarily. A lot of the time, first impressions are wrong. Um, but beyond first impressions, reflex tells us that uh, when we see a, a good looking person or uh, when we're used to seeing someone within one context, at church, for example, we tend to think what we see is all there is. 
And the time of courtship is needed uh, for reason, right? To do its work, right? To see that person in different, um, in different contexts, to, um, to explore the other elements of their personality beyond that first good impression or beyond that, uh, their outward appearance, uh, which suggests that, you know, uh, the part equals the whole, right? That the, the good I see is a reflection of their entire person. Right, so that's one area in which uh, we have these, we have these two systems operating within our mind and we can't get rid of them, but we're required to understand them and move uh, in our lives in such a, with an understanding of, the, of, of these two systems and, and avoid the pitfalls of, of reflexive thinking. So um, a useful way of illustrating the danger and the weaknesses of our cognitive limitations of our natural reflexive thinking is this concept I'll share called the ladder of inference. Again, why am I sharing this? Um, it's because an important part of um, determining how we develop in this movement and the positions we take when shakings come, it has to do with how we view each other and how we treat each other, right? And a lot of the time we can have negative experiences uh, with one another. How do we survive those negative experiences with one another um, where we can still have uh, goodwill and love for one another? and where we can still be united with one another, right? Because Satan, if he cannot throw people off course at the doctrinal level, right? He then seeks to agitate animosities or gripes or differences, cause people to brush up against one another at the interpersonal level. Right, And a lot of the time people part ways, uh, not necessarily because of, or, or maybe not initially over a doctrinal difference, but because they got bruised one way or the other. And they did not know or understand how to process that, uh, that development, or rather they responded uh, in a way that led them to, to where they ended up. Right. All these things are critically important. So one, one way in which God safeguards us, and this is, I'm getting ahead, this is where I want us to eventually get to, which is thinking about how does God, given our nature, what safeguards has God given us to, to successfully navigate through these situations that we find ourselves in, to successfully navigate through these trials that we, that we will undergo. And one of the ways that he does that is giving us a knowledge of our nature, right? We're going to unpack that some more. But uh, part of giving us a knowledge of our nature is, is, is understanding how, um, really how unreliable our reasoning, our uh, reflexive thinking, and our instinct, and our intuition, and our perceptions can be. We rely on instinct, intuition, and perception to get through daily life. But when it, but we need to understand their limitations and how they can lead us into conflicts, and how they can. Uh, lead us into situations where, uh, uh, and how they can lead to divisions uh, between us, right? So one way of illustrating the weakness 
of our uh, perceptive ability, our cognitive limitations, or our tendency to live in the realm of uh, reflex is the ladder of inference. Uh, what is this ladder of inference, right? It, um, it is a way of illustrating a, 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 a human thought processes that often lead to bad judgments, right? It's a way of illustrating human thought processes that often lead to bad judgments. So you have this ladder And at the bottom rung of this ladder, you have observable data. What is this observable data? It's the vast sea of information and stimuli in which we are constantly immersed, right? As human beings throughout the day, were constantly bombarded by oceans of information, whether it's on our gadgets, whether it's from the people that we hear, that we interact with, their speaking, their body language, their tone of voice, all of that is information, right? So we begin with observable data. If we think of a scenario, as we go through these rounds, we'll narrate a scenario uh, that will follow, carry us through each step, right? So you begin with observable data. The scenario is you have a room full of people and you've presented these people with an idea that you have. It's an idea that is really close to your heart. You think it's a good idea and you're watching the room to see how uh, these people have received your idea. So as you're watching this room, you're taking in Va you, you, the room and the people, they're the, obser they're the observable, uh, they're the observable data, right? Hope you're following. The next rung on the ladder is selected data. So, um, there is too much observable data for human beings to process, to take in all of it. So as a natural, instinctively, we select small quantities of, of the available observable data to make deductions about the world. Right? The part equals the whole. So instinctively, we make deductions. We take in small quantities of the all the, of all the information available to take in, and then we we can only process so much, right? That's our cognitive limitation. So we we select the data that we that we're going to to work with. In the scenario that we're discussing, uh, you know. So you see the room full of people, you're watching them to see how they're going to respond to this idea of yours. And you see a woman uh, rub her neck, she shifts in her chair a little bit, and then she checks her phone, right? That's the ob selected data that you've uh, zoned in on. The next step in the ladder is that you make assumptions. from the observable, from the selected data that you've taken in. This is where meaning is added to the data that you have selected, right? So we, we, you see the woman, she rubs her neck, she shifts, her chair, shifts in her chair and she checks her phone. That's what you've noticed. 
That's the data that you've taken in. So you make assumptions about what you've just seen. What is the assumption that you make? She seems uncomfortable. From those assumptions, you draw conclusions. What is the conclusion that you then go on to draw from the assumption that she's uncomfortable? The conclusion that you draw is maybe she doesn't like my idea and is just not saying. Are you following? Yes, I will. Right? From drawing conclusions, we then adopt beliefs. Right? After you've observed her and you think about it, right? You adopt the belief that, um, you know, this person, you know, you come to the conclusion that, you know, maybe she, she does not like my idea and is not saying. As you think about that, you come to believe that, you know what, this colleague, she does not share forthrightly when, when she has something to say, that they're not open with you. Right? You adopt a belief based on the conclusions that you've drawn about the, uh, about what you've observed. And based on those uh, beliefs that you've adopted, you take action. What is the action that you take? on the basis of the belief that you've adopted, right? You then start to ask that colleague more direct questions on the basis of the understanding that, you know, they're hiding something, they have something to say, but they're just not open. You take action, you start to ask that person more questions than you ask other people, right? So um, this is the ladder of inference how we go from, you know, the phenomena that we see, the interactions that we have, right? How we formulate, how we uh, interpret this information, adopt beliefs on the basis of them and take action on the basis of uh, our interactions. So uh, this creates bad judgment. It creates bad judgment due to um, what we can I call recursive loops. Right? There is a recursive loop, be loop between what we believe and the selected data. What does that mean? Our beliefs lead to choices about what data we select. If one believes that the colleague, that the lady, that she is uh, secretive or untrustworthy, your tendency will be to focus on the data that supports this belief and ignore the data that does not. Do you understand that point? You believe you saw, you believe, you know, your belief that she is, uh, say you came with that belief, with that pre existing belief, right? That you had that inkling about this person already there, that they are, they are secretive and, and untrustworthy or something, right? You will tend to witness, you'll tend to select things that confirm that idea and you will tend to ignore cognitive dissonance, right? You'll tend to ignore things that would tell you otherwise. Right. And the other recursive loop is between the actions we take and the observable data that we witness. 
So actions taken, such as asking that colleague more questions in staff meetings, right? They will lead to situations which present chances for them to become uncomfortable under questioning. And those situations will produce more observable data, which, which confirms your conclusion that this person is not open with me. They're uncomfortable when I ask them questions, uh, when I ask them questions to essentially try to get them to be open about what they think. Do you get those two points? Or have I lost it? Okay, um, please, if I've lost you, just, just say. Um, so, um, right here, the problem begins with the data which is selected and the assumptions that are made, right? Um, what are ways that we can avoid the pitfalls of this ladder of inference because this this right here is the source of a lot of if not the source it plays an important role in a lot of conflicts that happen in our lives in our lives as in, in our work lives in our relationships between people in our relationships in this movement it's these faulty limited it's our cognitive limitations, right? This reflexive thinking, which leads us into trouble, right? So what are ways that we can avoid the pitfalls of this ladder of inference, this model of reflexive thinking? But we must climb down the ladder We need to climb down the ladder, step by step, right? And we do this by always questioning. Always question your assumptions. And conclusions about people. especially if they're negative, if they have negative assumptions and conclusions, always question your assumptions and conclusions about people, about your brethren, uh, because you understand your cognitive limitations by virtue of your human nature. That you only, you're only, you're only selecting a small portion of the data upon which you're basing your assumptions and conclusions about that person. Another way you can um, avoid the pitfalls of this ladder of inference is to seek contrary data. Seek contrary data, right? Seeking contrary data, um, seek contrary data, even if you have to make it up. In the scenario we're looking at, what would this look like? It would be to think to yourself, you know, maybe she was checking her phone because she has an important deadline she is anxious about. And maybe it has nothing to do with me at all. Maybe it has nothing to do with her not liking my idea at all. Maybe it's something else entirely. Do you get it? Hello, Temple. <clears throat> yes. I have a question. Um, um, and it would possibly reflect that you left me some, some, some time ago in the presentation. But the, the ladder of inference, um, we, we saw the definition for the term inference and it's the process whereby we reason, um, we come to a conclusion through 
the process of reasoning. Um, so the latter for me, it, it seems problematic. And I think it, 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 um, it enhances the, the fragility of truth. Um, because they have different ways of defining truth as objective truth. And then you have the subjective kind. And for me, the ladder of inference seems to speak to a subjective form of truth. And I don't know if that's the intention or that's the ultimate outcome that can, can result from, from this process. But I'm having a, a huge hang up on the word assumption because for me, assumption kind of, it, 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 it soils the whole idea of objectivity, if that makes sense. So my, my question and, and my hang up, I guess it's because I have a friend who some time ago I had made a suggestion to her and um, the idea of assume, assuming just, just seems wrong. And so I started developing the idea that when you're going at something, you should never go at it with an assumption. You should go at it free of an assumption. So I'm really struggling as to whether or not this ladder you, you have shared is just the overall process one takes from observing something to taking action. Is this the... Is this the is this the only process? Is there a process that is free of assumptions? Um, and I if guess. no, mm -hmm. if no, I can see why the, the the Trump base is saying there is your truth and then there is my truth. And then I'm saying too, but then there is the truth. But how do you come to the truth if the truth is reached through assumptions? It just, I don't know, I, I'm really struggling. By the way, I didn't watch the presentation from Elder Parminder, so probably that's why I'm having a hang up, but um, I'm sorry, I'm just struggling with the assumption part. Okay. If, this, if I may. This this ladder of inference does not deny the reality of objective truth, right? There is objective truth here at the level of the ob observable data. Right, there is objective truth at this level of the observable data, right? There is a truth as to, as to how the people in the room receive the idea. And there is the truth of how, how your colleague, how that woman felt about my idea. Do you get it? There is the objective truth of that. But our co limited cognitive processes, right? Objective truth does exist, but our cognitive limitations, that's the point of this thing, to show us the limitations of our natural uh, sort of uh, deductive way of thinking, right? Um, and how it leads us to bad judgment. Because yes, there's the objective truth, but you see how naturally human beings, we do this all the time. We only take in, naturally, we only take in uh, a portion of the information that we are observing. And we do make assumptions about what we've seen, right? So we go down this process. So the point is that understanding, understanding. not denying the reality of objective truth, but taking <laughs> cognizance of um, our weaknesses and limitations which often lead us to misinterpret that that objective truth or fail to see that objective truth right 
uh, that's what this process is identifying. So you select the data, you then come to beliefs and assumptions, conclusions about that data. And we're saying that if you are in a situation, yes? Yes? Um, I have a point. Based on your, your ladder yes. in France, yes. um, it reminds me of when I'm doing my my SBs in a sense, because what I would have to do, I would have questionnaires, right? Some questions, right? And hand them out to hear a person's feedback. And then um, that would, then I would have to have the, the method of how I collect the, the data, right? And so I would have um, I, I would have to write something of how I collect that data. And then you have um, something like a chart or something that you present the data on. So you're still looking at it and you're observing the, the, the thing. And then you work out whatever you need to work out until it reached to where you have the analysis of data when you analyze it so you're still going through a process to reach to your conclusion and then you have the discussion part when you discuss it then you have your conclusion so it kind of remind me of mm -hmm. your, your of inference yeah it's taking in as much it's taking in and reasoning uh out as much information as possible uh, understanding your cognitive limitations based on your, you know, a, 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 a quick judgment, right? It's understanding your limited. That's why you go through, uh, I guess, the process that you've described of analyzing and, and so on and so forth. Right. Um, a lot of the time, Right, we select data, limited data, and we uh, draw, make assumptions and draw conclusions on the basis of that uh, limited data, right? So when we come to a point where that, hey, you know what? I don't think I, I trust this person anymore, this colleague of mine, they're very secretive right? You, you can reason out where that sentiment is going. It will eventually lead to a difficult relationship, if not a rupture with, with that colleague down the road, if that sentiment is cherished. So picture a scenario like that in this, in, this, in this movement. You know what, I just don't trust this person. I think A, B, C, A, B, C and D about them. So reason with that, right? Question your assumptions and conclusions, right? Come back to the pool of observable data, come back to that pool of observable data from which you selected the information that led you to your conclusion about that person and see if there's any contrary information in that pool of observable data. Uh, you know, uh, Ellen White may say it as always look for the good in people. Uh, yes. You're hearing me? Yeah. Yeah, you remind hear, me yes. of an incident that happened in you remind me of an incident that happened in Kingston, where this young girl mm -hmm. she went to this party and then another girl saw her looking at her. Came to her conclusion and started to fight with the girl. Oh, the girl is in actually in coma. She nearly killed her, you know. So people can lose their lives simply by by people just quickly find the conclusion um, and just. You know. Yeah. Yeah, you know. Um, so okay, so I've been going on for a long time. I'm just winding down now. If you can stay with me just a few more minutes, concentration-wise. 
Um, so the ladder of inference illustrates the, the weakness of human perception, right? Um, the majority of conflicts, the majority of conflicts emanate from these faulty processes of perception or have a significant component involving these faulty uh, processes of perception. But, and again, it's not denying that there is an objective truth of a given situation, there is. But it's, the, it's, it's, it's how do we arrive at it, right? Because our natural thinking, as we've just illustrated, often leads us to, 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 to wrong conclusions on a given subject. And we come to that objective truth again by, by, by reason. So I have a story. I have a story that I'm going to share, which illustrates this, this dynamic, which illustrates how quickly things can go south in terms of how we view and relate to people. It's called the story of the hammer. The story of the hammer. I'll read, it says, so a man wants to hang a painting. He has the nail, but not the hammer. It occurs to him to go over to his neighbor and ask to borrow the neighbor's hammer. However, at, at this point, doubt sets in. So the man starts speaking to himself. He says, what if he doesn't want to lend me the hammer? Yesterday, he barely spoke to me. Maybe he was in a hurry. Or perhaps he holds a grudge against me. But, but why would he hold a grudge against me? I didn't do anything to him. If he would ask me to lend him something, I would give it to him at once. How can he refuse to lend me his hammer? People like him make other people's lives miserable. Worse, he thinks I need him because he has a hammer. This has to stop, I will not be treated this way. And suddenly the man marches over to the neighbor's door, rings the doorbell, and before the neighbor can say anything, the man shouts, I really don't need anything from you, you can keep your hammer. So that's the story, right? Do you, do you catch the point it was making, you know, about the, uh, the, that cognitive process, how he, how he went from, uh, you know, needing the hammer, then making assumptions then quickly drawing conclusions on the basis of that of those assumptions and adopting a belief about that person then he went to that person with a whole bunch of baggage right in his interaction with that person which undoubtedly shaped the outcome of that interaction with that person do you get the point the the, the story is, is making though about how we think as human beings. Yes, Elda. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we see that it is um All right. So having having illustrated this point Right, we come to my, my final point, the final point I want us to talk about, which is um, how does God protect us? We see the weaknesses and the limitations of uh, human cognitive processes, how they are often, uh, if not the source, often play a very prominent role in conflict, right? Uh, and there's a whole lot more that goes into it. There's our upbringing, there's our education, there's our culture, 
which is all along the way influencing, you know, these cognitive processes, influencing the data we select and the assumptions we make about people. So this should, this should cause us to be a very wary in forming uh, conclusions about people, especially if those conclusions are negative. Right? Ellen White does not lay out all this, uh, you know, does not lay out psychological models like this. She would just say, you know, uh, Satan seeks to sow division among God's people and, you know, we can close the door to his temptations. Right? We can, we should always look for the best in each other and so on and so forth. She just says that that basic level, but we are unpacking it further, right? With the information that we have today about psychology and so on. How does God safeguard us? How does God protect us? Or how does God seek to protect us from the limitations of, of our own nature? That's the last question and I'm asking it as an open question. How does God seek to protect us from the limitations of our own nature? Any thoughts? And it should and it should follow our process, correct? Uh, not necessarily. I, I'm just looking for your open thoughts. How do you think God has provided for us, right? What do you think God has provided for us to protect us? from these pitfalls and problems of our human nature? I guess he educates us um, through the word. Um, one other thing. We you said he educates us with his word? Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? So, as we read the word, it gives us a better um, idea of, of people on a whole and how, because we see different illustrations through, I would say, the parables of how, like, especially we wanted the public, the Pharisee and the publican, and the, God gives us those information to show us um, that we should have more of a reason. We should reason more before we come to a conclusion of people overall okay point taken any thoughts anyone else um i would say he gives us methodology um and i guess those those methods or systems will guide slash direct how it is that we come to the conclusions we come to. And those methodologies in and of themselves test the, the thoughts that are generated to ensure that they're correct and in line with, um, and in line with, with, yeah. <laughs> I don't know the rest. Well, I guess, I. Table, I'm sure you can you can fill in the gap. <laughs> a huge one though it was, but in, in short, I was just saying that he one of his safeguard safeguards and his ultimate is methodology. Um, I think that's how he basically contains or base or direct how it is that we think, streamline our thought processes to the correct conclusion, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, and I think, uh, what was it, uh, Tamara who made the previous point? Well, Tamara somewhere, sorry, I'm forgetting. Uh, I think it was Tamara. Uh, anyway, the, the two points that have been made. 
Sorry, who was that? It's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Okay. Yes, that the two was, points that I. Okay. You can make your point, Elder. Okay. Um, the the points that have been made get at I, I guess the the two points that in my look at this <clears throat> at this uh, issue that I've been seeing that uh, God seeks to protect us. He seeks to protect us by by giving us a knowledge of our nature. Yes, yes, um, Elder Tabo, as I was going to share about our worship last night, and we were discussing, like, we can understand why people don't have faith, and, like, you know, because people do not understand their nature. We were looking at, I think, was Psalms, I don't remember exactly, but... We were discussing how, because the reason why we react, how we react, because we do not understand um, the honor that God placed on us, or as you have mentioned, the nature that we have. We do not have an understanding of it. So just by you going through the letter, the ladder of inference, you're seeing how, well, I am seeing how, I messed up a lot in regards to people. And this is what, just what you're doing now is, it is educate, giving me knowledge, educating me how my nature is and how I am to respond to, to people. So that is, I believe, that is God's safeguard for us. Amen. Right. allowing us to gain knowledge mm -hmm. so, so god protects us by giving us this knowledge of our nature and if we know our nature we know uh we know not to trust uh our cognitive processes because we work on on limited data right uh so we know to to um you know, we can be activistic in terms of policing our thoughts and how we look at people to say, hey, I know the I know my human nature and the tendency is to tendency is to see negative and the tendency is not to see the full picture. So I'm going to look for the good. I'm going to see contrary data and I'm going to question my own assumptions and conclusions as a matter of of um, as a matter of discipline, as a matter of standing because you know any little any little chink that satan can get to drive wedges between us as brethren and people and to uh, foster negative feelings and assumptions and thoughts about each other he will take that and work with it right so so we've discussed how the uh our cognitive limitations operate at the level of studying god's word Right. And here we've laid out how they operate at the level of how we interact with one another. So the second point in terms of God safeguards for us, uh, it relates to what uh, Antonisha was saying, that God seeks to. Uh oh. Sorry about that. God seeks to give us one lens through which to, to view the world. How is it that God is going to bring and, and is bringing uh disparate groups of people different from different backgrounds different cultures different family different family of origin issues um uh different traumas that they've suffered in their lives 
all of these things that shape how they perceive people and situations, that shape how they select data and make assumptions about their interactions and the people uh, that they come in contact with. How is it that God is going to bring such people into unity? Um, he gives them one lens through which to, to view the world. And I'll elaborate on this. He gives us a knowledge of our nature and it gives us one lens through which to view the world. And this one lens is um, a set of beliefs. He gives us one set of beliefs, right? Which collectively we can refer to as, as a message, right? Which forms our worldview, which shapes our worldview and thus influences the data we select in this ladder of inference. He gives us one lens through which to view the world. And when we say lens, um, we're saying this is a set of beliefs. Or a message. Right, so uh, the message is coming in here. The message is coming in here at the level of, uh, sorry, wrong thing. The message is coming in here at the level of beliefs, right? And it breaks this recursive feedback loop that we identified, right? It, 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 it influences the, the data we select. And the suggestion is, is that it, it is Okay, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, so it influences, he gives us one lens through which to view the world, right? Um, a, a, a set of beliefs, a message, which form our worldview and thus influence the data we select. Um, in my notes, it gives us one message, the content of which shapes our perspectives about the present and the future. So um, the way we can safeguard against the pitfalls of, of our human nature is by one, understanding, right? onboarding the information that God is giving us, the understanding that he's giving us of our nature and its limitations. So we're always aware. And two, he gives us, um, he gives us the message and the message is, is one lens, right? One lens through which we, we all view the world and the testing issues of our time. That's how God protects us. And that's how this unity, that's how this unity, which is otherwise practically impossible is achieved. So what must we do? We have to do the work of shaping our minds in accordance with these beliefs. And this is done through study. Right? Our strength and our unity depend on our viewing this world through the same lens. There's a relationship between um, the lens God gives us in terms of the beliefs and the objective truth, right? Because there is an objective truth, we struggle to, to, to arrive at it by virtue of our nature. 
but God is giving us, is helping us by giving us a lens, right, which reflects the objective truth. At a doc, that's at a doctrinal level, right? That's at a doctrinal level. But um, we must also think of this just in terms of our human interactions as well. So that is the end of my study with us today. Do we have any thoughts? We've been talking about reflex versus reason. And it's just a, a recap and, and development of some thoughts that were shared at the Islands of the Sea Camp meeting. And again, we are covering this because we, we know we are approaching the formalization of the message. And it's always at the formalization that the message becomes hard, right? It's always at the formalization that the message becomes hard. And we can insulate ourselves. We can have an arc against the, the storm that's coming by taking in this, this information, understanding our nature and uh, receiving the lens, the progressively unfolding message, right? Uh, receiving the truths that form the lens, right? Which unites us all. Do you have any thoughts, questions, or additions? Was it helpful? Was it useful information? I don't have any addition. It was informative. Okay. So if there aren't any comments. Um, thank you, Alex. Yeah. I, I really yeah it's it was it was really a good so yeah i enjoy valid information you know to consider praise god even if you don't agree <laughs> or even if anything is unclear you know just state and we'll, i'll answer all right but if there isn't any i guess uh we can close with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word and to um, review, Lord, to, to, to develop this understanding of the nature of man, our own nature and its limitations and how these limitations all too often lead to the conflicts um, the conflicts that end in separation and division. There is the human level, and Lord, there's the doctrinal level also. And you've given us the information that we need. Help us to play our part and to position ourselves to stand on the side of truth and position ourselves to see things aright, both now and in the times that are approaching. Please bless us through uh, the rest of the Sabbath day. May we keep these thoughts in our minds. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.